Welcome to the Road to Innovation, powered by the Kleinert Foundation. On each episode, we delve into innovative solutions to society's most pressing issues like sex trafficking, homelessness, and poverty. We hope that with each conversation, you'll be inspired to take actionable steps towards social change. Here's your host, Hannah Rabelais from the Kleinert Foundation. Welcome to another episode of the Road to Innovation podcast powered by the Kleiner Foundation, and I am your host, Hannah Rapolet. January is known as National Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and I'm so excited to have these two lovely ladies all the way here from Fort Worth traveled in the rain to be on our our show today. Um, So I have Melissa Ice, who is the founder and executive director at The Net, and also co-founder of The Worthy Co., which is a social enterprise under The Net. And then I have Sarah, um, who is is um, the director of operations at the net and also is a co-founder at the worthy co welcome to the show ladies thanks for having us um so let's kick off for those in our audience who are listening who do not know about the net or the worthy co can you just give like a brief kind of summary of what y'all are doing yeah, so the NET is a nonprofit in Fort Worth, and one of the things that we do is we serve survivors of trafficking, which we've been doing since 2012. Um, and since then, we've had the opportunity to serve over 800 women in Fort Worth. Wow. And really, what we're trying to do is provide them with resources and recovery. Um, and we have several different programs where we provide advocacy for them, as well as mentorship and social engagement to help them fully find healing and freedom from the life of exploitation that they experienced. Wow. And so what led y'all to start the Worthy Co? So can you kind of talk about like that dynamic with having a house under an actual nonprofit and what does it mean to be a social enterprise with y'all's model? Yeah. So we started the Worthy Co within our nonprofit a couple of years ago, and we really just kept seeing this problem come across with the women that we were serving that um, they were checking all the right boxes and really succeeding in their recovery. You know, they're being reunited with their family and getting restitution with the courts and getting, you know, educated and things like that. But they still had such a hard time finding employment. Um, And the employment that they were finding was not necessarily gainful employment. It was just a low wage hourly job in a lot of cases. And so we just kept seeing this problem and we, just wanted to do something about it. (laughs) So of course we looked around, we thought, who can we partner with? Who can can help us in this? And just felt like this is something that that we can do and that we wanna provide for women. So we created the Worthy Co. And it's within our nonprofit and we employ women that are in, the survivors that are in our program. Um, We employ them within the social enterprise and they hand make candles and jewelry and um which we are aware yeah. all of us are wearing yeah. some yes, worthy co stuff <laughs> yeah. we have a lovely candle on our table yes. and some behind us so and it's they smell incredible i think my favorite is the fig and olive leaf which we have back here it is so clean i love it i think i gave like 10 of them out to my friends for christmas <laughs> so they're awesome so if you want to go buy one yeah. they are <laughs> yes. so worth yes. it yeah. um yeah. but i want to go back to why is it so hard for to find employment for mm-hmm. women who have been trafficked can you just touch on a little bit like what are the barriers to employment for those women yeah i think that i mean there's a ton of mm-hmm. barriers for them and one of which is just a lot of the women that we work with all of their abuse began in early childhood, which just means that they started out with experiencing trauma from a very early age. Mm -hmm. One of our employees, um, sadly, as young as the age of three years old. And so just imagine at that point, the trajectory for your life is Mm -hmm. seemingly set in stone. And the kind of opportunities that someone like myself or someone else who hasn't experienced that um, are just going to start looking a lot differently. And so we found for our women that they are overcoming really a lifetime of trauma. And so what was done to them over a lifetime, now they're at this place in their lives um, where they're ready to start undoing some of that. And at the same time, they have to provide for themselves, for themselves and for their children. And so it's a weird kind of transition phase for them to be ready and willing to do the hard work of recovery. And then at the same time, needing sort of instantaneously, as we all do, you know, when you graduate college or Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, it's time to start paying bills and it's time to provide. And for them, not having the skill sets necessarily to do that, because while I was learning some of those by working at the mall and working at restaurants as a hostess, um, they were unfortunately being exploited and they were Mm -hmm. on the streets. And so that's one of the challenges that they face. 
Yeah, I would say another really big challenge is just the way that our society and culture views them. So, you know, all of the women that work for The Worthy Co. were entered into the sex industry as minors, as children, and we know now that that's that makes them considered to be sex trafficking victims, but all of them turned that magic age of 18 and all of a sudden, you know, the things that they were, that were victimizing them are now things that make them seem as criminals and that our society looks at, at as criminals. And so, you know, they might have a background that an employer would look at and really not be excited about and would make them choose the next candidate. So that's a really big barrier for them too, is just the criminal background that a lot of them have. Because a lot of the women have felonies, correct? Mm -hmm. And yes. so just like that barrier of trying to educate employers, it's like, no, they were not criminals. They were victims of this crime. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's just like, it's so sad that we have to do so much work to even still kind of shift mm -hmm. the perspective in our culture and society mm -hmm. to look at them, these women in a different way, in a more dignified way. Um, so let's talk about y'all's business model. So I want mm -hmm. to just kind of dive into the, the journey y'all took going to visit Thistle Farms, which is a social enterprise in Nashville. Can you talk about how y'all landed on a 501c social enterprise because we've had on the show past for profits kind of a different mixture mm -hmm. but why did y'all choose to go down this route and what are some kind of what are some challenges that you have encountered <laughs> with this so many things well them? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well i can start with just the the thistle farms aspect of it because i feel like in a lot of ways that gave us sort of the gumption to really jump in with both feet i think prior to that we would say that we dabbled in mm -hmm employing women. We had sort of program type uh, opportunities. Mm -hmm. Classes. Classes. Training. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Classes where people were making bath products and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and it was going to Thistle Farms that really ignited the spark um, in our team because what we saw, what was so encouraging to me is that we saw a group of women who are being employed and who were not only surviving, but thriving. And, and it's the exact same group of women that we have been working with in Fort Worth. And so it felt like there was a little bit of a kindred spirit there mm -hmm. because we realized, okay, this is possible. I think that a lot of times we, you know, we shouldn't look around, but if you look around, um, we work with adult women. And so sometimes we see either resources or funding going to um, programs that are related to domestic minor sex trafficking, which mm -hmm. is amazing because we need they need so much. There's mm -hmm. so it's actually still lacking, even though there is a little bit of a spotlight mm -hmm. on that particular group. But I think that, like Sarah said, once they sort of pass a certain threshold, um, those opportunities start to become increasingly limited. And so going to Thistle Farms and seeing them um, have the programmatic piece, which we also do as well, mm -hmm. but then also the social enterprise and employment piece. And you know, for those that don't know, it's the nation's largest social enterprise that employs survivors of trafficking. And so just seeing somebody several steps ahead of us, mm -hmm. um, by several steps, I mean 20 years, so two decades <laughs> ahead of us, I'm like, oh, thank goodness, you figured out all the kinks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just the fact that they're so generous with their model. Yes. And we've had many yeah. opportunities to go to Nashville and sit down with Hal, their CEO, Jim, their head of manufacturing, and we've sat under Becca's teaching and sat down with some of the survivors that they've employed and have gotten to learn so much from them. And that sort of gave us the courage to take the first step. Yeah, something that Becca said when we were there is that justice is not a competitive sport. Mm -hmm. And that really inspired us. And, and like Melissa said, they're so generous with their model and, you know, really want, I mean, their end goal is that more and more women are empowered and get dignified employment and are able to change their lives. And so seeing that play out and seeing their generosity and that really inspired us to come back and and offer that same thing for their women. And I think also seeing um, just from a nonprofit standpoint, the sustainability that it offers for their nonprofit, yes. um, it's a significant revenue stream for them. And the fundraising thing is sometimes <laughs> the a fundraising challenge. hamster wheel yeah, that you get on every year. <laughs> it is, and, and it's, um, it was exciting and encouraging to see a new way, well, not a brand new way, but a, um, an innovative way to create a funding stream for your nonprofit. And so yes. that was exciting to us as well, in addition to the program side. Yes. Um, and on the business model side too, I would say something that differentiates us and maybe Thistle Farms where we're sort of in the same camp is being, you mentioned being a 501c3. So we are a nonprofit, which means 100% of our profit goes back into our programming. Um, and so that's just another interesting aspect to it because 
simultaneously, we are creating a product, we are a business, and sometimes our product is competing with other products, maybe who have less challenges in regards to their employer or people who they're employing maybe are higher skilled Mm -hmm. and we're dealing with sort of the programmatic piece of like we have intentionally taken on women who are lacking those skills so that we can provide them with a safe opportunity to learn those skills in a really gracious environment so that it's not cutthroat or for Mm -hmm. a lot of them they go straight from out of incarceration into a job where you know the employer isn't if they do something wrong, if there's a misstep, um, if a crisis comes up, if something, if their trauma is triggered, they um, lose their employment. And mm-hmm. so we want to be that. Um, but at the same time, we're also trying to have a successful business mm-hmm. that is profitable and a product that people love. And so um, our business model is tricky, but we're committed. <laughs> we're going to do it. We'll That's what counts. It. Other people have done it. So mm-hmm. we know yes. it's possible. Yeah. Can you talk about the price point in products and like mm. how is it, it's so hard to break into the market, especially when you're kind of paying a little bit more for labor, you want to pay a dignified wage and you're competing against like Bath and Body Works mm-hmm. where their candles are still $20, but you know, there's just so many, I feel like, especially for social enterprises and especially for the customer to understand like, why are they paying just a tiny little bit more mm. for your product? Can you mm-hmm. talk about maybe the, you know, how do you educate your customers? How, how do you talk about it? Um, to kind of just under for the customer to understand like why um the price point is that high sometimes i think we we one of the main ways that we help people understand is just saying each product is handmade and i think that connects the idea that it's a real person behind each and every product that you know comes to work and sits down at at the work table and and hand makes them and i think that 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 connects for a lot of people um, a lot of our customers just really get that and really really want that direct impact on a real person you know there's a lot of things that you can buy at target or walmart you know that are made in factories and Mm -hmm. and by someone that's a world away but when you connect the story of this is a real person that lives in fort worth texas and and has kids and has this story and and so i think telling stories and humanizing each product is really um has has been the way that we um that we kind of explain our price point but what we found is people really get it and they want to have that impact and they want to choose they want to spend their dollars on something that changes someone's life so so you really think the story is really what sells customers or a little Mm -hmm. bit of both because your jewelry is cute your candles do smell amazing but you kind of lure them in a little bit more to kind of like complete that purchase with like hey you're actually making an impact in women's lives and that's kind of like the cherry on top of like oh yes a hundred percent i would I bought 15 myself. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're very passionate about our product being, you know, standing alone on its own without mm-hmm. the story behind it. So we really want to create cute, trendy, fashionable things that we would wear ourselves, yeah. um, which we do every day, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. um, or candles that we burn in our own home, um, which I do every day. But um, yeah, so we want our products to stand alone. Um, but like you said, it really is kind of the when you share the story behind it, it really um, encourages people. To, part- to join in that story and mm-hmm. be a part of it. What is like one thing you wish you had known before you started this venture? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be here all day. Just it's probably just one. not just okay. one thing, just but one. yes. There's mm-hmm. so many. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think we talked a little bit about the, the program versus the business side. Sarah always talks about her business school of hard knocks via like <laughs> YouTube tutorials <laughs> and webinars and podcasts and audiobooks. Um, I think something, it's not necessarily that I wish I would have known, but that is being reiterated for sure, is just having a really healthy relationship with failure. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think that essentially as a social entrepreneur, something that we're doing on a daily basis is sort of waking up, um, looking over yesterday's failures, what went wrong, and learning from those mistakes, pivoting, and sort of picking back up and keeping keep going and um, I think that if I if both Sarah and I didn't have a healthy relationship with failure um, that would have taken us out a long time ago and so I think just um, I think I would want so- other social entrepreneurs to know and for us all to be like it's a safe place we can say it out mm-hmm. loud that you literally just fail every day um, but you're it's trial and error and you're learning from those mistakes and every mistake you make or every complaint you get about something or something that you did wrong is an opportunity to grow and improve mm-hmm. and so I think that is something that's really important that we're 
learning as we go and then and then anytime you expand into anything, you're like, and it's a whole new area of unknown and potential failures like waiting to happen. But if I saw it that way, then we wouldn't maybe ever take the next step. But instead, we kind of put our nose to the ground, we figure it out, we do some things wrong, and it's almost like perfect. Okay, we did these things wrong, now we know what not to do next time. And yeah, that's just something that is super important throughout this process. Who up for you, Sarah? Um, well, I'll be honest, I completely underestimated the retail world and um, <laughs> what, you know, we always say that we didn't start a jewelry and a candle company because we were passionate about jewelries and candles. We're passionate about providing jobs for women, empowering women and changing their lives. Um, and so in my naivete, I was thinking, oh, candles, you know, I was I, we decided we would make candles because I was making them in my kitchen for gifts. <laughs> and I was like, this is easy. I can teach people how to do this. Anyway, so, you know, <laughs> it's one thing to make a product and it's another to sell it to people and yes. to be, you know, to market it and e-commerce and shipping and fulfillment. It's just has been a much bigger learning curve than I expected. I think I was a little overconfident going into it. And uh, I'm like, I've worked at anthropology. Like, I've got this. Um, <laughs> You do, and y'all are doing but, such an incredible yeah. job. No, like you, yeah, you got you. yes. No, but yeah, no. that's something that I, I think I would have um, maybe weighed that a little more um, when starting out, just realizing that that's going to be a huge learning curve, and um, you know, figuring out product development and design from the from supply chain to marketing it and selling it and getting it in someone's hands, it's it's a big endeavor and has an an endeavor that has nothing to do with empowering women and. I mean, nothing to do with like the program side. Um, and so that's something that I wish I would have taken a little more consideration in. <laughs> I know, we say all the time, sometimes when we're doing things that are just business product related, we're like, oh my gosh, some people, this is their like full-time job is they just <laughs> do this one part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we also are still running an entire nonprofit with other programs mm -hmm. and fundraising and development. And, and working with other populations, and, yeah. you know, in addition to traffic. And, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> fundraising. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All those things yeah. too. So, um, but. And also picking out designs for our cute new sweatshirts that are coming soon. Yes. <laughs> Stay tuned. They're so cute. We don't promote multitasking, but. It's part of our survival. Yeah. It's like a coping mechanism. <laughs> yeah, it's just life of a social mm -hmm. entrepreneur. Um, how many women are in your program? How do you? Or how many women are you employing currently right now? We have three women that we employ part time right now, and um, it's been really fun to see them grow in each of their. Um, you know, we started them on kind of smaller number of hours. You mentioned earlier, um, just the it, the labor costs are high to pay people in the United States and we pay, you know, of course, above minimum wage, a fair wage in Fort Worth. And so, um, and so we have been able to expand their hours kind of slowly over the last um, few seasons. And it's been really fun to see them grow and just find so much ownership in what they do and the products that they create. And um, they're really passionate about, about the quality of their products and they get so excited when they see people wearing them. <laughs> yes, I think that's important too. And Hannah, I feel like it's a lesson that we learned from you really early on when you were giving us a lot of advice and wisdom on what does social entrepreneur look, uh, social entrepreneurship look like um, when the mission and the business is the people that you're serving. Yes. And for us, you know, as all businesses do, you hope to grow, you hope to scale. And something that we've done per your advice early on and some other people that we spoke with is when we felt tempted to kind of go out and especially during busy seasons, holiday seasons to we we're like, we need 20 more people. Mm -hmm. We need we need so much more manpower and help. Um, instead, we intentionally chose to give the women that were already employed with us mm -hmm. additional hours um, just to increase their longevity with us, their personal sustainability. Um, and so I think that's been exciting for us to consider the people that we employ and that we're serving over maybe what it would look or feel like. And when you ask that question, if we could say 30, because mm -hmm. I think that feels like, that feels good to me. Mm -hmm. That feels good to people that are listening. I think there are some people who just heard three and thought, wait, wait, three? only three, mm -hmm. wait, 
and that's Adequate. actually a really intentional decision mm -hmm. on our part and of course as we expand into our new space which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that number will increase but that's something that I think I would have been nervous to say and right now I'm actually really proud that we only have three employees and that we continue to invest in them. That just gave me goosebumps. <laughs> yes because the women deserve mm -hmm. to have more time invested into them so going deeper with the women versus you know because yeah. yeah it's it's sexier to say a hundred more women and of course mm -hmm. donors are like oh my gosh you're doing so mm -hmm. much but it's like what, what is the impact really on those mm -hmm. women's lives? Is it a frantic workplace? Like, is it just like two hours here, you know, three mm -hmm. hours here? So it's, I love how you go deep with the women mm -hmm. and not afraid. Like, you know, this is what we, this is the reality of the women in our workspace. Um, so yeah, I want to pivot to the future of the Worthy mm -hmm. Co. So y'all are doing such great work. There's so much new happening. So can you just share with our listeners, like what does the next almost year look like for y'all? Yeah, there's a lot happening. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, we're just riding, hanging on, riding the coattails of it all. Um, so I think the biggest thing is that we bought a building a year ago, actually last January. And so we have been in the really fun process of getting permits and renovation and construction. <laughs> And so that is what we have been doing. So your project manager is on top of being executive director and co-founders. <laughs> yes, yes. Now we're general contractors. No, I'm mm -hmm. just kidding. Um, we have one of them. Yes, we do. Yes, <laughs> we really did. We hired a real one. But um, yeah, I think that that is the thing that we are most looking mm -hmm. forward to and most excited about. Um, currently, we have operated in a 200 square foot church classroom. And, and so to say that everyone is on top of one another and that product is stacked on top of each other is our current reality. But I think something that's super exciting is when we move into our new um, workspace and our building is that we will be able to um, just produce more and better product mm -hmm. because we'll actually be able to buy and store the things that we need mm -hmm. to make better product. And so that's super exciting. And there's a retail component to the space as well. And so people, We'll be able to come and shop and see, feel, touch all the things and smell the candles, of course. And then um, at the same time, see some of the women that we're training and with, with the purpose of employing them. One of the m reasons we have a retail component is because we didn't just want to have a retail store, but we wanted to train women in retail. And so that's one of the reasons we have that. And then we also have a candle making studio. And so that's just kind of a fun little added piece to it. Um, and what is a candle making studio? So candle making studio is I said that with like a so the <laughs> candle making studio. Glad you asked, Hannah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> a candle making studio is essentially just a candle making class. And so it'll be a class where every person who comes gets to make their own candle and sort of curate their own vessel and fragrance and. That can be for a birthday party or a girls' night out or a date night. And so we'll be offering those classes for people to come. And I think what's unique about that is that every person who comes to that class, the story behind them paying to be there is as you're here and having this kind of experiential fun night or afternoon, you're at the same time employing and empowering women mm -hmm. right here in your city. And so every class, of course, 100% of the profit goes back into employing more women. So that's something that we're doing in our new space. What are you excited for the future for the Worthy Co? Melissa touched on it, but my the thing I'm the most excited about is just being able to expand the type of employment opportunities that we can offer women. You know, right now, as we're like, like she said, working in a 200 square foot classroom, um, really what the women are able to be trained in and to get employment through is hand making the products. Um, and that's a really important piece to us because it's very empowering. It's therapeutic to work with your hands. It's a great starting place for the women that we're wanting to employ. But we really, you know, another main goal that we have is to create transferable work skills. And if I teach you how to make candles and jewelry, you can do that in a very small amount of places. So it's not necessarily transferable, even though it is empowering and it is providing a living wage for them. Um, but we're wanting to expand upon that and create a little bit more upward mobility for the women by giving them opportunities to get experience in retail uh, in cu retail management, customer service. You know, we're going to be doing a lot of shipping and fulfillment and so they can learn about how that works and they can get experience there. You know, I even want to see women in our sales and, you know, maybe they're running our wholesale accounts and they're visiting boutiques and sharing about our products and things like that. You know, I want them to be able to have experience and positions that they can then go to a number of other places and be transferred and, and apply to or, you know, move on to any number of places and, and have that gainful employment. Um, 
not just in that sort of artisan-based model. So that's what I'm really excited about and our, our new space will allow us to do. Oh, yeah, I think that's incredible. something new that we learned along the way is I think every social mm-hmm. entrepreneur would say that you your, your business model just kind of changes um, as you go because you see pain points mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, that's actually not beneficial to a healthy business or to the, my employees. And so for us, the artisan base was kind of how we started, not knowing where exactly we were going to go next. Mm-hmm. And I think we just started thinking about it. And I have some friends who are artists. <laughs> and I'm like, to be an artisan for a um, person who hasn't experienced a lifetime of trauma and hasn't had to <laughs> overcome all those obstacles, it's actually really hard for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, Even if you have a great support system and a great product, it's a hard lifestyle. And so something that we have decided along the way with interacting with the women was that knowledge-based career training we just, we realized is so important for them um, because we truly want to set them up not just for success when they're um, within our reach Mm -hmm. and they're in our fold, but we want to set them up for success no matter where they land. Mm -hmm. They have a really good set of skills that can provide them not just, again, a minimum wage job, but that upward mobility piece. And so we're excited about that, but it's also new because it's another pivot that Mm -hmm. we're taking right now and something that we're really committed to. Yes, I feel like flexibility is so key and being able to, yeah, take those challenges Mm -hmm. and be like, okay, we need to address this and like, let's pivot our business model. So I just Mm -hmm. admire how flexible you'll have been and being able I just think again the upper mobility piece is so important like I think as social entrepreneurs we need to realize that yes we're addressing their current needs and kind of like Mm -hmm. that crisis like let's get you a job let's get you employed like let's address this immediate need but how do we prepare our employees for the future it's kind of Mm -hmm. an opposite business model like you kind of for-profit traditional (laughs) for-profit business are trying to keep their employees y'all are Mm -hmm. trying to like here go fly go do something go get a Mm -hmm. you know a higher paid job like we want you to leave if that's Mm -hmm. your if that's your intent like of course I know y'all want to keep mm-hmm. the women who want to stay and that is yeah. that is something that the women just want to do um but being understanding that you know some women don't want to work retail mm-hmm. but giving them the option to be able to do that upper mobility is so key and that's why I love y'all so much um we are running out of time but I just want to kind of towards the end I want y'all to share just like a favorite story y'all have I know we can't pick one another can't pick yes. one but like do you have a favorite moment story just the past couple years that y'all been doing this it can be from your time at the net or the worthy co just anything y'all want to share with our listeners yeah i think something um that i have told some people recently is that one of our employees um was just able to um buy her daughter braces which sounds like sort of like normal, like, yeah, that's what moms do. (laughs) Um, But I remember her telling me how proud she was. And when she was telling me about it, she, you know, had tears in her eyes. And she said that she thought that was, that was something that only, you know, rich people did or only normal Mm. people did. And for her having experienced being in and out of the criminal justice system and on and off the streets and in and out of sexual exploitation, um, it was something that she was able to provide that she felt like quote unquote normal people were Mm. able to do. And as a mom, she wanted to have the opportunity to do that too and so I just think that's such a neat thing that through employing women um, we of course are accomplishing our mission of employing empowering them but they're accomplishing their goals and their mission and they want to be empowered to be a good mom mm-hmm. just like just like I do like we all you know any mom does and so I think it's so neat that this you know not to degrade it but like a silly candle and jewelry company mm-hmm. is getting to provide her with that dignity of doing something um, to help her reach her goals as a parent. Yeah, I think just on that same note, my favorite moment happens every pay period when I get to run payroll and put real dollars into these real women's bank accounts. And and it's not a gift and it's not charity. It's not a giveaway. It is money that they've earned through hard work and through um, them coming and showing up every day on time and, and working really hard and doing a great job. And, and it means that they get to do things with it that they want to do with it, like pay for their daughter's braces or, you know, get a few things for their apartment or put, I mean, even just food on the table. And that is just, I mean, I'm struck by it every time that I, you know, push those buttons because, um, because I know what it means for the women, um, what it means for the women in their real actual lives because we have you know because I'm with them every day but um yeah that's my favorite moments that I get to be a part of for sure through the worthy co 
Mm, incredible. So tell our audience where we can find y'all. How can we support you? Is there volunteer opportunities? How can we go buy product? Um, share with us just our, your call to action. Like, how can we support you guys? Yes, we need all the help. www. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're online. We have an online store. It's at worthy-co.com. And all of our products are available there. But the best way to kind of keep up with us, I think, is following us on Instagram and Facebook. Because um, so we are posting all the time just behind the scenes and new products. And you're kind of the first to know um, when we have new things rolling out. We're growing really fast and things are moving quickly. And so that's the best way to kind of stay up to date with um, things going on. So it's at theworthy.co. So that's on Instagram. And I think, too, if people are local to DFW, that when we do open Mm -hmm. sometime in 2020 our store, our physical um, space, for people to come and to shop and to check it out or sign up for a candle making class at our studio, just things like that, knowing that it's the community support that allows um, us to employ these women and to affect their lives in that way. And so I think just making something fun out of it mm-hmm. and you know for people who are local they get to physically get to participate in that and then for people who are local too like you said volunteer opportunities if people want to um, be a part of what we're doing we do lots of different aspects on the program side everything from jail to having um pool parties and we have events and we have a survivor support group every week and so we're always looking for people to partner with us in that and if they wanted to a great first step is that we have two um, trafficking trainings every year. We have a biannual trafficking training that people can sign up for on our website and one happens in the spring and one happens in the fall and that's an easy first step to learn more about us and to get involved. Where will y'all store be located in Fort Worth just to give them a general idea? Yeah so for people who are familiar with Fort Worth it's on the near south side so okay. outside of downtown and it's actually on a street called Magnolia which has um, it's kind of a walkable street with some restaurants and retail and so that's where we'll be. And I also want to encourage y'all to sign up for the email list. They do give like exclusive sneak peeks and maybe sometimes some sales, especially around Black Friday season. So definitely sign up for their emails as well. Um, but ladies, thank you so much. And I'm just so excited for the future of y'all. And thank you so much for serving Fort Worth and Dallas because I really want to reiterate because I am from Fort Worth and I live in Dallas now that what happens in Fort Worth and Dallas all affects each other. Yeah. So we're all, let's st- let's stop the rivalry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're all family. We all yeah. live in the same metroplex. But just thank y'all so much for the impact you're making on these women's lives and just the education the awareness that y'all are bringing out and just changing the conversation trying to change your culture to look at these women differently um and thank you guys so much for listening to the road to innovation podcast powered by the kleinert foundation thank you so much and have a good day thank you for joining us on another episode of the road to innovation powered by the kleinert foundation If you'd like to learn more about today's social innovator, please visit kleinertfdn.org or the podcast website at theroadtoinnovation.com.